Good afternoon. Uh, this is Craig Bamak Crisp. Thank you all for joining uh, our webinar about the Medicare reports that we've created with a partner for the limited data set from CMS. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. I'm showing a couple minutes past the hour, and um, and we have a lot of people on. So thank you all again for joining us. I want to offer a couple quick programming notes. Um, first, we are going to record this webinar. We'll make a link available to folks that couldn't make it or that want to rewatch portions of it afterwards. Um, likewise, we are working on documentation uh, about these reports and how to use them and other reports from Chris. Um, so be on the lookout for those in the next um, few days or weeks. Um, we will take questions in the, in the box on the right of your screen. Uh, feel free to type them in at any time. We'll do our best to answer questions uh, that are appropriate during the, the webinar itself. Um, or we'll answer them at the very end. Um, and if you do want at the very end to, to raise any questions over the microphone, um, you can go ahead and raise your hand uh, with the icon on the upper right. And, um, and at the very end, if we have time, we will unmute folks for questions and answers. Um, but I recommend using the chat box or the, the question box. Um, and we'll compile them and, and answer everything at the end. If we run out of time, uh, our contact information is at the end of the webinar. Uh, both myself and Jerry Reardon. Uh, so, of course, as always, feel free to contact us anytime um, about what you're about to see today or uh, anything in the future. So with that, let's jump in. Um, so if we could go to the first slide, please. Um, so I want to, uh, very quickly, before we get into the reports themselves and the demonstration, just a little bit of level setting, both on what CRISP has been up to over the past few months, and also uh, how, how the data that we're using to create these reports relates to other data and other reports. Um, so first, as you all know, uh, much better than I, uh, hospitals are under, and quite frankly, our whole healthcare systems under increased pressure to look at population-based activities that increase quality and hopefully um, reduce total costs, or at least preventable costs and utilization. Um, CRISP has four high-level activities that we feel um, we can do to support hospitals as they implement uh, strategies around population health and potentially new redesign activities. And, um, and these four things align with the update factor requirements proposed by the HSCRC. Um, so doing things like flagging patient relationships and sharing data uh, care alerts and care plans for patients who are under management, um, using alerts built into the workflows directly into your EMR, um, I think are incredibly essential operational steps. Um, but today we're going to focus on the fourth one, using CRISP reports. There are a number of different reports that we offer. Uh, most of you are likely familiar with our case mix-based reports in the both static portal and through Tableau. Uh, we also do have total cost of care reports based on your hospital's primary service area using Medicare data. And, um, and now we have limited data set based reports. Um, so the next slide, I um, find it helpful to outline the types of Medicare data available um, because it is, it does get confusing sometimes um, for all of us. Um, so the hospitals, the hospital association and the HSCRC um, all understand very clearly how essential data is to both plan and execute these new strategies. Um, there are clearly two types of data that should be made available. Um, data that's sufficiently detailed so that you can do that planning and, execute and, uh, and implementation design work. And then of course, patient level data that helps the actual care coordination activities. Um, the two sets of data, or the reports based on two sets of data that are now available through CRISP meet the first data need. Um, these are the, the chronic condition warehouse total cost of care reports that are uh, pretty up to date. They're uh, uh, about a 90 day lag um, and will be updated monthly and show uh, zip look code level and primary service area level uh, Medicare Part A and Part B information. And then today, the limited data set, um, which is more detailed, but also uh, not quite as updated. Um, I want to point out the fact that um, as hospitals have the opportunity and join or choose to, to um, 
to establish their care redesign programs under the new amendment. Um, identifiable Medicare claims data will be available, and that will be the data you want to look to for patient level um, care coordination activities. And so um, just be on the lookout for that. And I'll also make the quick note that um, through case mix data and case mix reporting, um, there is patient level identifiable information available through things like the PATH report and a Medicare high needs beneficiary list. Um, and if you have questions about that, um, by all means, please reach out to either myself or Jerry. So the next slide um, just gives a little more background about this the identified data. Um, you sh you're likely all familiar with it, but um, we did get a special limited data set from CMS to specifically meet the needs of Maryland. Um, the major difference between what we're getting and what is uh, widely available on CMS.gov um, is that this is, includes 100% of physician data instead of just a 5% sample. Um, we also got the 2015 data a little bit early actually, which gave us a head start. Um, every hospital in the state, uh, and thank you for, for doing this, signed a DUA um, with CMS that named CRISP as the custodian, and that is the way you're able to view these reports. That's the, kind of the legal connection. Um, some hospitals also had themselves or another vendor as a custodian on those DUAs, um, which meant that you received a copy of the raw data itself. Um, if you would like to receive the raw data or update your DUA, uh, reach out to us and we can do that at any time. Um, hopefully, uh, these reports will either save you from having to make a separate investment um, or at least give you a more clear indication on what you might want to invest in um, in terms of reporting and analytics. Um, we have a vendor uh, that we've selected through uh, a couple different means uh, called Hmetrics, who has produced this first set of reports. Um, I, I just want to, to their credit, but also as you look at these reports, uh, we selected Hmetrics because they have um, specific and nationwide experience with things like ACOs and bundle payment programs. Um, our goal for these reports was to put out something as quickly as possible so that hospitals could get to work. And um, that means that this is not going to be a perfect, complete set of reports. Um, it is not um, intended to be, quite frankly. It's intended to get the information into your hands. And then we very much look forward to working with our hospitals and other stakeholders to figure out um, what enhancements can be made to these or what we can do for the identifiable reports potentially. Um, so please keep that in mind that, that we wanted to get these reports to market quickly so that you had something to work with. Um, and that uh, I think we're all on the CRISP side extremely happy and optimistic um, having worked with HMetrics um, in both their ability to uh, react and respond to our requests and get these reports out in a very punctual way. Um, So with that said, let's go to the next slide. Um, to access these reports, hopefully this screenshot looks familiar to most of you, um, anybody with any hospitals with credentials to currently um, view the CRISP Tableau dashboard um, will have a button on that main portal that says Medicare LDS data. If you click on that button and then the, the label that says LDS dashboard, um, the report link will come up and you click there and it will pass you through to these reports. These reports are now live. Um, if you do have any access issues with the reports themselves um, or if you need credentials and, um, and want to request them, please go ahead and contact support at crystal.org. Um, again, you can also contact Jerry or myself. Um, and with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to the team at HMetrics. Um, to pull up the reports themselves and, and run a demonstration. Thanks, Greg. I'm just logging in right now. All right, so as uh, Craig just mentioned, this is the tool that is made available to all the hospitals um, in Maryland that is based on the Medicare LDS data set. Uh, so what we're looking at here is what you would see when you first log in to the system. Um, this is the the tool itself is split into two main sections: the population analytics, uh, 
which is more similar to like the ACO type reports. And then the episode analytics, which is similar to the bundled payment type of reports. Uh, so those are the two main sections. Um, and as you can see, there's the list of the reports are listed below here. And there's there's quite a few reports. Um, given the time, we won't be able to go through all of them, but I hopefully we'll get through enough of them that you get a good idea of where you can find what you know the the information that you need. However, if you do get lost a little bit, we do have this um, this help section. Uh, what's showing here is a glossary of terms because we realize not everybody, especially with all the acronyms in the healthcare world, you know you, you can get lost a little bit. So, for instance, if you don't know what a CCS is, uh, we have it listed right here, um, along with a number of other important terms within the tool itself. We also have this LDS data basics, uh, which is kind of like the help section. So if you kind of, like I said, if you get lost and you you know exactly you want to look at the episode opportunities, you can just click here and it'll take you right to the, the report that will uh, give you that information. Uh, then there's also information about what the LDS is and other um, important things like how we calculate the cost, cost adjustment factors and so on. But Let's jump into the population analytics section first. So what we're looking at here is the PMPM by demographics. So this is one set of uh, the PMPM reports. This one looks at the demographics. So this was, this is going to be all day today. We're just going to use a demo hospital. Um, and what you're looking at here is a slice of their population based on demographics and some of the some of the different data about those demographics. So, for instance, age category 64 and younger. We have it split by gender, and then it tells you how many members are within that particular demographic, uh, the percent of the membership, total claim payment amount, and the percent of the payment amount, as well as their average uh, payments per month, all the way to the right. Uh, and then we have obviously all the way at the bottom, the total across all the different demographics. Uh, we have bar charts here that show the same type of information, now just in a little chart form if, if you're more inclined to look at the charts. Uh, and then we have the uh, different races here for uh, different demographics to look at uh, based on this hospital's population. We have similar charts for type of service and uh, based on county also. Um, but I'm going to jump to diagnosis summary. So this is getting at if you want to understand uh, the types of issues or types of uh, diseases that your patients um, have within that population and um, the distribution of that as well as the payments that are attributed to those patients. So in this case, we're looking at the CCS, which is just a, a group of ICD-10s. You can think of it that way. Uh, so for instance, this category here is all the different diseases of the circulatory system, such as hypertension, uh, different heart diseases, and so on. Uh, we give the member count for each of those different CCS categories, the total payment, and then again, the PMPM, so you can look at how, how costly they are per month. These, all these charts also can be filtered. So for instance, you can choose a specific county if you wanted, uh, or if let's say I wanted to only look at uh, the heart failure patients, I can filter that down and say, I just only wanna look at the heart failure patients. Um, and I would filter these charts based on that specific um, filter that I choose. You can also choose the year. So as Craig pointed out, these are 2012 to 2015. So you can choose which year you wanna look at. Um, and this is, again, of course, restricted to only the Part A and Part B members. We have other reports, such as uh, the different providers that your patients um, go or see, the different home health and SNF providers, uh, the DRGs, and the different BETOs. But I want to jump over to the episode analytics to kind of give you an idea of how one might go through these tools and use them. Um, most of these reports are gonna be similar in nature and are, are fairly straightforward. I find the episode analytics to be um, a little bit more difficult to navigate. We've tried our best to, to group them in such a way that it makes it a little bit easier, but I just kinda wanna go through the different sections of this so you can fully understand how, how this tool is set up to work. 
So as you can see in the episode analytics section, um, we have three subsections. We have the financial performance, the acute care management, and post-acute care management. There is a fourth subsection down here called drill down analytics, um, but I'll get into that more later when we actually start drilling down into the reports. The financial performance subsection is really more of the high level type of reports that deal with the episode payment versus uh, different benchmarks and how your hospital is performing at a, at a very high level. So these are more of the macro level type reports. The acute care management and post-acute care management is starting to look at possible solutions and areas of opportunity for that hospital to reduce the payments. The acute care management subsection is looking at things that occur within the short-term acute care hospital, such as length of stay and readmissions. Whereas the post-acute care management section is looking at what happens after the patient is discharged, uh, which home health, which, which skilled nursing facilities, and which inpatient rehab facilities that your patients are going to, and what kind of readmission rates might be occurring in the different payment distribution that occurs from those different uh, post-acute providers. Each of the sections also have a dashboard, sort of like what we're looking at right here. So this is the financial performance dashboard, for instance. So as you can see, this are, these dashboards give you just a very high snapshot with, of, of the, the pertinent information within that section. So in this case, we're looking at a comparison between the total episode payment versus your, your average target price. Um, as well as the episodes above and below over here on the right. Uh, so these are the episodes that are, that the total episode payment for that episode is below some benchmark uh, or above that benchmark. So if they, it's above that benchmark, that means there's probably some opportunity to reduce that payment down. It's usually due to things like readmission or high cost post-acute providers. Whereas when it's below the target, or benchmark, that means the, that particular episode performed well, and maybe you want to show that to physicians on different practice patterns. Then down below, this is we have this up front here so that uh, to give kind of context to the, the episodes that we're looking at. So just as a quick reminder, uh, the episode is the initial index admission along with 90 days post-discharge. So in this case, we have the short-term inpatient uh, taking up uh, about almost two-thirds, but this also does include readmissions, and then the different post-acute providers uh, that, that follow from that and how much those payments go towards the average episode payment. One other thing I want to point out before we go into too many more of the reports is kind of the layout of all of the episode analytics reports. So as you can see, you can choose which provider that you have access to, the different DRG families. So right now we're looking at just congestive heart failure, but I could switch this to all and look at the hospital as a, as a whole. And the, the report then changes based on that filter. If you don't want to look at specific DRG families, you want to look at a specific DRG, you can also filter by that. And then uh, again, this is 2012 to 2015, so you can choose which time period you're looking at. This right now is just looking at a, a, a fiscal year 2015. So that's the financial performance. The other reports within that section, again, just kind of drill a little bit further down into these higher level reports. Uh, but I want to jump to the acute care management section. Again, just as a reminder, this is where you would be looking at different opportunities or areas for improvement within the acute care setting, things such as length of stay or readmissions to either your own uh, hospital or to other hospitals. So it's loading up the dashboard right now for the acute care management. This dashboard, again, just shows you kind of the, the main snapshot areas that you might want to look at within this section. Up at the top here, we have all the different MSDRGs. Um, there's quite a lot because right now I'm looking at all. Uh, and this is also uh, sorted by readmission. So we see septicemia for this demo hospital has the largest number of readmissions and a very large number of episodes also. 
Then down below, we have a chart for the trend of the length of stay. In this case, we see that the hospital uh, its length of stay is pretty constant. It looks like it might have gone down a little bit in the third quarter of 2015. On the right, this is a chart that I really have always uh, liked a lot when I first started looking at bundle payments. This kind of explains uh, how important readmissions really are when it comes to episodes. So you see the left bar chart is the episodes with readmission. The average price here is about $62,500, where episodes without readmissions are about $26,000. So it's significantly more when you have a readmission. And your normal thought might, might be that it is simply due to the readmission itself, but the readmission itself here on average is about $25,500. What actually is happening is the post-acute is also, or post-discharge is also increasing quite a lot. And this is uh, obvious because after you have your readmission, those patients are then discharged to another a different post-acute provider. So it's almost like the episode starts over after the readmission. So looking at simple dollars, readmissions are important. And obviously in Maryland, readmissions are important for other reasons. Um, but in this case, we're just looking at the dollars. On the bottom left, again, continuing the readmission issue here, we're looking at the number of readmissions back to, so the index hospital is where the patient initially started the episode. Uh, so this would be, this would mean a readmission coming back to that same hospital. Uh, in this case, 19% of all episodes came back to the same hospital. Whereas the right-hand chart shows you the number of readmissions that went to a different hospital. So outside of an episode type of uh, viewpoint, these might be patients that you don't even realize had a readmission. In this case, um, the, it, that is captured within the episode. And you see that 14% for this hospital, 14% of all episodes were readmitted to a different hospital. So these are, this, is, this is really important to look at um, because it's something that you might not have realized uh, was actually going on with a lot of the patients. And then we have the different trend numbers for those readmissions over the time period selected. So coming back up here, um, again, as I pointed out initially, we had septicemia seemed to be, have a really high readmission count. Maybe you wanted to look at those charts for just septicemia. What you can do is you can actually just select the DRG up at the top, and it will automatically filter and show you the different uh, charts below restricted to just that DRG. In this case, you see that uh, they have a very high readmission count. It looks like it's jumping to both back to the hospital and to other hospitals. Um, and you can get kind of the different information there. You can also, as I pointed out earlier, you can choose uh, which DRGs you want to look at from the filter up at the top. So again, let's say I was interested in congestive heart failure, as I was before, and I can see that some interesting things are happening here. The length of stay seems to be decreasing over time. That's a good thing. Um, but the average, the readmissions are significantly more expensive, and there's a large number of readmissions. Um, so maybe as I was looking at this, I want to look a little bit more into what's going on with the congestive heart failure readmissions. Uh, they seem to be pretty pronounced and very expensive. So one way I can do that is I can just jump over length of stay here because it looks like the hospital is actually doing quite well with the length of stay. So I'll jump to readmission overview report. So this report here just gives a high-level summary of the different readmissions for the selected DRGs. In this case, we're looking at all three, uh, 291, 292, and 293, the three different DRGs of the congestive heart failure family. The table at the top gives you the volume for each DRG and the percent of readmissions. So you can see with this demo hospital here, they're averaging about 41% of CHF episodes are being readmitted. Uh, we have the total payments for the index admission, so that's the initial hospitalization, as well as the total readmission payments. So you can see in, in the case of this, this demo hospital for CHF, they're actually paying more money for readmissions across all episodes than they're getting paid for the initial index hospitalization. Readmissions obviously are a very big deal when it comes to this hospital CHF episodes. Then we have the average episode payments for episodes with readmissions, the average same facility readmission payment. So these are the, uh, the readmissions that came back to the initial hospital, which looks like about 74%. 
but 26% of the readmissions were going to a different hospital. And maybe you want to know more about which those hospitals are, and we'll be looking at that um, in a second. And then just below, we have a lot of that information in chart form here. So we have the three DRGs of the family, the readmission rates, and then the average readmission uh, DRG payment. Um, the readmission rate by tip, by DRG. So we can see here, um, it looks like 291 readmission rate is going up over time. Um, but luckily 291 is not the highest volume and 292 seems to be a, a bigger deal due to, due to volume alone. So now we're gonna to jump to the readmission analysis. This is good, getting a little bit towards what I was saying before, where this hospital had 26% readmissions that went to a different hospital. So maybe you want to look at, you know, those readmissions that came back, as well as which hospitals and which post-acute pro type, provider types are actually causing these readmissions, or at least not necessarily causing, but where these readmissions are coming from. So this report, as you can see, lists each of the different episode readmission providers. So uh, since we have this listed as the CRISP provider, the demo hospital, we know that the patient starts at the CRISP provider, but then they could end up at any of these other providers for a readmission. So this first row, set of rows is where they came back to the initial hospitalization. Whereas some of these other ones, so for instance, this one means that they went to St. Francis Hospital uh, for a readmission. The second column tells you the first post-acute care. So this is something we use a lot throughout, uh, especially in the post-acute care management section. The first post-acute care is where the patient was discharged after that initial hospitalization. So this top row here means that the patient went to Chris provider, was admitted there for a CHF episode. They were then discharged to a skilled nursing facility. And because they're in this readmission analysis, we happen to know that then they were later readmitted back to the Chris provider. We don't know yet what, for what reason, um, but that's that's why they're listed in this this column or this row right here. Turns out there was about 19 of those episodes. Their average payment was $72,000, which uh, if you remember back from the beginning, the average episode for the CHF was around like 30 something thousand dollars. So these episodes are very expensive. Whereas the index payment was uh, a little shy of $17,000. So the remainder was all post-discharge payments, which the majority of it looks like it was from the uh, readmission, which is almost $33,000. Maybe you want to know more about these specific, the, all these different readmissions. Well, just below that table, we have a list of all readmissions uh, for the CHF episodes, along with the responsible physician. So this is the physician in the index hospital that is responsible for that patient's care. Uh, the readmission MSDRG, so why were they readmitted? What was the DRG? The index and discharge date so you can know when this occurred within the time period selected. And then some different payment information like the total episode payment and the index payment, the readmission length of stay, and then some of the readmission payment and post-discharge payment. But as you can see with this hospital, there's quite a few readmissions to try to go through. So maybe we wanna you know, limit that down a little bit so we can actually understand what's going on. So in this case, uh, I'm gonna look at these, I, maybe I wanna look at these 19 episodes. I wanna know, you know, who are these 19 patients that came back and w why did they come back to my hospital? What was the, the readmission reason? By selecting any of these rows up here, it filters the table just below to only look at those episodes. So right now down here, we're only looking at those 19 episodes now. And we can just kind of glance down here and see that, okay, well, it looks like there were some more heart failure readmissions, um, and then uh, quite a few of them, actually. Here's an HIV. So it just allows you to look at what, what were the causes of the readmissions, as well as uh, the responsible physicians. So in this case, it doesn't look like any of the uh, physicians, but this, this physician here had two readmissions, but there could be a chance where you might have uh, a specific physician having a large number of readmissions, and that might tell you like, that there's a pattern there that you wanna look more into. 
Um, in this case, that doesn't look to be the case. You can also, again, look at, say, just the um, episodes, the readmissions that went to a different hospital, so you can see what, why that happened and who were the responsible physicians for that episode. And then getting a little bit further, so I, this is the first report that we started really looking at physicians, where, where the physicians are really uh, obviously play a very key role in the episodes. Um, based on where where the patients are being discharged, like the discharge planning, um, especially more in the orthopedics and surgery. But in this case, uh, maybe we want to look at how the different positions are performing under this current filter that we have is we're just looking at the CHF patients. So what this report lists is each of the different uh, responsible physicians for that selected episode family. Um, and it gives information such as the average length of stay by the physicians, the average payment per episode by physician, and then the readmission rate by physician. And then again, there's a table below that gives a lot of the same uh, information in tabular form instead. So we look up here, each of these tables also have a, uh, a line here that shows you the average across all the physicians within the hospital. And then we color code the bars to, to point out which ones are above or below uh, that line. In this case, it would be orange would be below, whereas blue would be above. It's important to note that orange and blue here does not necessarily mean good or bad. It just means above the average or below the or above the average or below the average. That average could very well be very high. For instance, in readmissions, as we pointed out before, this hospital had a 41% readmission rate. Uh, which is pretty high. So even the ones that are below, for instance, this position here is at 36%, the, the tool is not saying that that's good, so we color coded orange, it's just saying it's below the hospital average. But maybe I wanna look at, you know, so now, so I'm looking at this and I wanna identify a physician that uh, maybe is not performing as well as we would like, um, and we wanna try to understand why. Or maybe I wanna just look at Maybe my goal is to reduce readmissions for CHF. So I want to find a uh, physician that has a high readmission rate. Uh, so here's one physician, just picking one. Uh, this Dr. Beth here has a 55% readmission rate and also happens to have a higher average length of stay for, for one reason or another. Uh, what we allow within the tool is, again, I kind of mentioned this before, that there's drill downs within each of the tools. So Clicking on any of the physicians allows you to actually drill down into that specific physician. So this is the physician details report. So anywhere that you see a physician's name within the report, you can drill down to this specific report on that physician. Uh, and this is kind of a, I hesitate to use the word report card, but it's more of a, just a overall high level report for that physician. In this case, it gives you the average episode payment. Again, we're only looking at CHF, but we could technically change this to any and all uh, DRG families that that physician might have had episodes for. Um, so in this case, this Dr. Beth had about $25,000 average episode payment, which is actually you know pretty good. Uh, we see that the, the above and below, again, the total episode payment and the percent of episodes above and below. Uh, so most of uh, Dr. Beth's episodes are actually below, and that's probably why she had a lower target, or lower average episode payment. Then we look at the discharge pattern of the physician versus the hospital as a whole, along with the readmission count, readmission rate. So in this case, we see that you know she only had 11 episodes here, so it's not necessarily the, the best uh, pattern to be looking at, but we can see that uh, compared to the hospital as a whole, it seemed that this physician is sending more of the patients to a skilled nursing facility. Maybe, maybe I, I identify that as an issue. Um, it does look like that's actually a very high readmission rate, uh, so maybe that's something I wanna look more into. And then down below, we have the table that lists all of uh, Dr. Beth's episodes. So this gives you the index admission date uh, the, and discharge date. 
this episode sequence, which tells you in a, in a short form way what happened to the patient as they went through the episode. Uh, so for instance, this is saying that they started at a hospital, that's A, acute care, they went to the community, C, then they went to home health, and then they went back to the community. And we have first post-acute care. Again, this is that where, what setting they went to after, initially after discharge. Readmission flags, this is whether or not this episode had a readmission, and if it did, what's the readmission MSDRG? And then we have the total episode payment, total post-discharge payment, and then total readmission payment. But again, now this, this uh, physician doesn't have a large number of episodes. This isn't too hard to look at, but I, surely you can imagine a physician has more episodes than this. So again, we allow the interactivity within the tool to filter uh, the different tables within. So again, I was interested in skilled nursing facilities. So what I can do is I can just click on this and it'll filter that, that list of episodes down to just the episodes where this physician discharged to a skilled nursing facility, just these three episodes. Again, this is only three episodes, but if you wanted to filter it down more, you could even say um, that you do want only the readmissions, so this readmission flag filter. Uh, so that limits it down to just the two episodes now that had a readmission. Um, we see one of these is actually fairly expensive, uh, $69,000. Um, so maybe you want to know a little bit more about that episode. Uh, well, again, the tool allows for drill down. So you can drill down to this single episode. And what this will do is it'll pull up all of the claims the LDS claims that we're using to build the episodes and gives you that information. So you can see, again, the episode started on four, on April 2nd. Uh, the initial discharge date was 413 for the short-term hospital at your provider at this hospital. The primary diagnosis, the DRG, and the payment. Um, and then it follows this all along during the 90 days after that. So what's happening with this patient, it looks like uh, after the hospital, they got discharged to a skilled nursing facility, uh, and they stayed there for, it looks like, about eight days for $3,000. Uh, then there was another readmission uh, for a cardiac arrhythmia. Uh, then the 27th, they went to another skilled nursing facility. So what you can see here is it looks like this episode is expensive because of a high skilled nursing facility usage along with readmissions. There could be other things. I'm not a physician. You know, this might be something you want to sit down with a physician to look at the actual uh, diagnoses to try to identify, you know, what happened during this episode. Uh, maybe we shouldn't have sent this patient to a skilled nursing facility. Maybe uh, home health would have worked. I, you know, in this case, I don't know. Uh, but this allows you to look at the episode at the claim and diagnosis level to identify those type of issues and uh, change your care plan. Um, with by looking at the different the good episodes as well as the bad episodes. In this case, it looked like uh, possibly post acute, so maybe at that case you'd want to jump to the post acute care management section. So the post acute care management section is uh, an area where hospitals are are usually a little bit less aware of uh, outside of the bundled payment type of world. So this is what's happening beyond the four walls of the hospital, what happens to the patient as they uh, go through the different episode pathways in the post-discharge settings. Uh, so the post-acute care management dashboard shows the discharge pattern within that hospital. Again, we're looking right now only at CHF, and we can see that this hospital looks like throughout time is uh, discharging mostly to the community. So that's uh, under physician care, but not facility-based. Uh, and then there's the different other different post-acute uh, settings, for instance, home health, there's about 17%, uh, skilled nursing facility, and so on. Now, down below, we have the, uh, the total snapshot of the discharge pattern. So here you can see it very pronounced that community is by far uh, the, the highest in the discharge pattern for this particular demo hospital. Uh, and then we have the post-discharge payment by those first packs. So uh, skilled nursing is, is uh, the ex most expensive of the main facilities. Um, this other is, is mostly going to be uh, straight readmit. So this would be directly right back to a 
a short-term hospital, or maybe that would either be for rehab uh, or some other issue. All right, so now what, so we have this discharge pattern and maybe you wanna find, uh, as I said before, it looked like that episode could have been due to post-acute issue or, or something else. So there's a lot going on in the post-acute setting areas, but one neat tool that we have is this opportunity summary. Uh, we envision this as a place that when you don't really know exactly what you want to look at, this is a good place to start. It helps highlight some of the areas that um, are issues that maybe you should look a little bit further into. So what we're looking at here is, now this is no longer filtered just to CHF. We're looking at the hospital as a whole, and we're looking at the total opportunity dollars. So one word about this. So in this, in this case, this hospital has, according to the demo here, is $46 million in, in possible opportunity. This opportunity is built around hospital internal benchmarks. So again, when I was talking about those averages, those averages could still be high, um, but right now we're only looking at uh, performance within the hospital, not overall potential better performance beyond what you, what's going on within the hospital. What I mean by that is this total opportunity, the, the actual overall opportunity for hospital could even be higher than this. This is just saying if you could improve a little bit within the hospital, this is how much of an opportunity you, you could have. I'll talk a little bit more about how this is calculated uh, in the next report. But for now, let's look at, so what this does now is there's four main sections of the opportunity summary here. You have your index admission DRG, you have the responsible physician, the discharge provider types, so this is again those different post-acute as well as straight readmit settings, and then the service lines. If you only, only wanted to look at the orthopedic line or only wanted to look at nephrology, you could just highlight this. But we're looking at CHF, so we can just click on 292, and it will then filter all of the other columns to just that DRG, and it will also update the total opportunity to what you have filtered. So we went from 46 million now to almost one and a half million dollars for this one DRG. And you can obviously see that this DRG is cardiology line. So there's of course no other service lines under this column. But now we have a list of the responsible physicians that are responsible for those episodes and the amount of dollars that they have in the previous year uh, that they could have possibly trimmed down one way or the other as well as the different the opportunities based on the different discharge providers. Uh, so maybe I wanted to look at this Dr. Jasmine and see if this Dr. Jasmine has a high number of direct readmits. Um, so that would obviously be a problem, especially since we've just been talking about readmissions in the, the previous section. Uh, there's also some possible opportunity for community home health and skilled nursing facility. So what's nice about this tool is you, you can see right away at a glance uh, which DRGs are important, which physicians maybe I should be looking into a little bit more, uh, which discharge provider or post-acute care settings, or if, if re direct readmits are, are a major problem. Or you can even look at a higher level, just which service lines should I be, should I be interested in. So let's say we've looked at all of this and we realize, yes, 292 seems to be quite important. Um, it's not the highest important, but I feel like maybe it's something that we could work on um, and get some real, real benefit from. So what I can do is I can drill down a little bit more and try to understand where this $1.4 million is coming from. So I can drill down to this opportunity summary details. This is also right here under paved savings opportunity. So all these drill downs that I'm doing, you can also get to directly. That's what this drill down analytics uh, was. So the physician details, for instance, is that physician report I showed before. I just wanted to highlight the, the fact that you don't have to go through all of the steps to get to a specific report if you don't want to. In this case, we're, we've we narrowed it down to only 292. So we see that there was 689 discharge uh, for a total payment of $13.6 million, of which 10% is identified as an area of opportunity of about that, again, that $1.4 million that we saw before. 
So where do we get this $1.4 million from? Well, the, the algorithm that we use uh, takes all of those responsible physicians and it clusters them based on a uh, similarity of practice pattern. So physicians that are similar with their, their practice pattern would be grouped together. Those that are dissimilar would show up in a different cluster. Uh, in this case, the algorithm selected six different clusters of physicians, and then it looks at the average post-acute care payment. Uh, so in this case, cluster one had an average of about $14,000. What this means is the dollars that were spent after discharge, um, so not that index admission payment, what happened in the 90 days after. Uh, cluster two, those physicians, of which 35 of them had 252 discharges, averaged about $17,700, and so on. Then what the algorithm does is it selects one of these clusters to be considered the highest performing cluster. It needs a, a, enough confidence in this selection, so it skipped over cluster one. I'll just tell you that's what I'm seeing here, is it skipped over cluster one, even though that was the lowest, it was only four physicians for 15 discharges. Uh, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, it's probably a bad idea to go to a physician or anyone else within a hospital and tell them, here's a benchmark based off of just 15 discharges or just four physicians, when we're looking at a total number of 689. Uh, it's, it's almost cherry picking at that point. So the, the algorithm knows that and it instead chose cluster two, which is a large number of the discharges. Now we're looking at 252 with 35 physicians. Uh, so even though this is cheaper, it's more confident with this number. The bar charts down here show you the discharge pattern of the different clusters. And uh, there's a large number of physicians here, of course, for the demo hospital. Um, but you can almost see right away the discharge patterns are all color coded based on the post acute setting. You can almost see the clusters uh, making perfect sense. It looks like uh, cluster two is a little bit of community, which is the purple, and the rest is mostly home health, which is this green. Cluster one looks to be mostly home health, cluster three looks to be almost mostly community, and so on. So you can kind of see how the, how the clusters are making perfect sense. These physicians are in fact similar. And then you see the highest performing cluster discharge pattern over here. Um, so you can see this particular physician cluster here has about 35% home health and about 46% uh, to the community. And what we have below here is just the average payments for the cluster and the payment distribution of that highest performing cluster. So now, again, how do we get to the opportunity amount? Well, it's, it's quite simple at this point is the opportunity is what would happen if all the other physicians acted more like this cluster two physician group? So obviously you can see some savings for this cluster of about $2,000 per episode and so on. So then we calculate all of that and we get the area of the opportunity. So the idea here is you would want to look at what's happening within cluster two, identify their practice patterns, and potentially talk to uh, some of the physicians in these other clusters uh, to try to get them to be more like cluster two, and that would that would give about 10% savings here. All right, I think that is it for the demo of the the tool. Um, I think we have enough time to open it up to questions, Greg. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, so there are a lot of good questions, and I'm just going to start to read out those questions that have come in, and Matt or Craig or anyone uh, on the panel who wants to answer this, uh, please do answer. The first question that came in is, how is the average target price calculated? Uh, before we get that answer, I'd just like to point out that several of these questions were already anticipated and are available in the help section. So Matt, if you could just take us to the help section and then just give us a brief answer, that'd be great. Yep, so uh, right here we have the target price and it gives you the steps that we use to actually calculate the target price. Uh, so, but to, instead of reading this whole thing, a very brief answer to this is we take an average, it's not really an average cross, we, we, we look at all the hospitals within Maryland and then we take a, a subsection of those hospitals, the top 25%, I believe, um, and then we take the average of that. So it's, 
we don't take an average overall or or compare all hospitals and you know group them all together and take just the cherry pick just the best episodes we are taking the the average of the better hospitals um so there's going to be some bad episodes in there there's going to be some good episodes in there uh, so, but this allows for a benchmark that's a little bit more uh believable that that you could ask, you could possibly achieve um, but like like George said, all of the more step by step explanation is is right here. Thank you, Matt. The next question, Craig, maybe you can answer this: is uh, can you view all hospitals in the state combined? Yeah, it's a, a really important question. Um, the every hospital that received the data directly from CMS received the exact same file, and it's the same file that Chris views. So there's no, there's no built-in limitation on the data itself. Um, CRISP, in order to be aligned with our stakeholders and our various uh, committees and hospital representation and others on those committees, um, has started incrementally, as we normally do, and we're providing each hospital with views of their patients only and of their hospital only. So there are not, uh, outside the benchmarks that Matt just spoke to, there are not cross-hospital comparisons, and you can't view uh, multiple hospitals together. Um, if that's something, uh, as I said, it's an incremental step. And so um, if we want to expand what people can see and the, and the way data is shown, uh, that's certainly something we, are, we would like to consider. Great, thank you, Craig. Um, we've got about five minutes left and a lot of questions coming in. So if you're not able to get to all of the questions, we will certainly answer the questions uh, offline. Um, the next one is uh, a question about benchmarks that can be used to compare. And I can perhaps answer that because, um, as Matt demonstrated, the Opportunity Summary is a dynamic benchmarking system that sort of compares uh, within yourself to identify these opportunities, opportunities on a realistic uh, basis. The one that he showed for congestive heart failure identified at that demo hospital an opportunity of $1.5 million. So that's for one form of benchmarking. The second form of benchmarking that is being considered for the next iteration is uh, an industry standard benchmark, such as uh, uh, something from a, from, from a company like Milliman and others that could be used as an external benchmark against which this particular data is compared. Um, the next question down is about the opportunity summary. Um, Matt answered that, and um, uh, if you want to know more about that in a written, written form, um, you will find that um, in this help section. So uh, if, you want, uh, if you want more detail on that, you'll find it here in this help section. Um, the next question was how the clusters are determined. Um, uh, I can again answer that in the interest of time. The clusters are determined using a proprietary algorithm. But Matt, if you could just take us back to that, uh, the clusters that you were showing us, uh, we'd just like to show you empirically what it does. Um, it essentially groups physicians that are um, similar to each other into the same cluster. So that's the key point to take away, that what it does automatically is it identifies um, uh, it identifies uh, physicians who practice um, similar to each other, and here you can see that um, uh, the physicians in cluster three almost always discharge their patients to the community. That's the that's the bulk of them, whereas the physicians in cluster five seem to send all of these patients to a skilled nursing facility. These clusters are within an MSTRG, so it is sort of an apples to apples comparison, and that practice variation is an opportunity to to try and um, uh, optimize the care that is delivered to these patients. Um, the next question down was, um, uh, can any of these reports be downloaded to Excel or to PDF? That is a feature that is being considered for a future enhancement of this particular tool, and that capability does not exist at this particular point. Um, there was a follow-up question to the benchmark question, so let me just read that really quickly. So the, 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 the follow-up question was about an external benchmark, and I think I've answered that, saying that in the next iteration of the tool, uh, what we plan to do is to add an external benchmark that says uh, how the state as a whole or how the nation as a whole 
uh, is performing on both these episodes as well as on the population side of things. I think that we've managed to get through pretty much all of the questions. Um, yeah, Matt, if you don't mind, could you please put it on the last slide? Uh, that has the contact information for, for Jerry and myself. I mean, we're happy, again, to follow up on questions. Um, and we can connect you with George and Matt. Uh, thank you both. I think it was, you did a great job. So just as a quick note, um, um, uh, Craig pointed this out at the beginning. Um, we have a recording of this webinar, and uh, it'll be posted on the web. Uh, one of the questions that somebody asked early on is, how do you access that particular link? Uh, what we'll do at the end of this, uh, 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 this webinar is collect the email addresses of everybody who attended, and we'll send a link out to those email addresses, so you should receive that directly as well. I think that's it. I don't see any other questions coming in. Uh, and, uh, um, and it's exactly one o'clock. So very well done, uh, Matt, on the demonstration. Uh, again, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we are always available to answer questions about these and other reports. And if you also want to talk about um, other things CRISP can do to help operationalize some of your population health strategies, please don't hesitate to reach out. Enjoy the rest of the day.